Hi there again, everybody. I am outside today. I, you probably guessed that. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's a hot day, but it's a beautiful day. I'm sorry you can hear all the traffic, but I live right next to a road. So I'm going to forge ahead. Here we go. Today is another one of my impromptu videos, mainly because I've been on vacation for the past week and I haven't had the chance to plan ahead, um, or maybe I have had the chance and I've been lazy and haven't done enough. It's one of the two. I'll figure it out eventually. Um, this video is the idea of my youngest child. I was like, oh, what am I going to do a video about this week? I got to do something quick. So they came up with the idea to kind of like I did uh, last time on A Little Princess. Uh, something about the book and why it is still a classic. They suggested Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. And I thought that was a fabulous idea, and I hope you do too. So I'm going to start going through this book, I'm going to review the chapters and what happens in it, and try to find out why it's still such a popular classic. Let's go! First of all, this is my copy. Uh -huh. It's uh, <laughs> whoa. It's not in the greatest shape because I've had it for forever. It was a cheap copy in the first place, but you know it's, it's well loved and it's well loved. And it's got the um, original Tennille illustrations. I love those. I just no other ones have really captured it to my feeling. Let's just go through the first paragraph. The first chapter is down the rabbit hole, and the first paragraph. This is how it grabs you off the bat. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank and of having nothing to do. Once or twice she had peeped into the book her sister was reading, but it had no pictures or conversations in it. And what is the use of a book, thought Alice, without pictures or conversations? Yes, that's my lovely oh-so-excellent British accent. I'm sure it's terrible. Sorry, British people. The way that grabs you, right? First of all, you get introduced to your main character. Always a good start to a book. Alice, we see she's a little girl and she is bored. This happens often when you're a little kid and having to do grown up things. And we've all had that feeling. So she's relatable. She is a child of imagination. She wants something that challenges her, but not too much. She also wants something to do. So in short, she is ready for adventure. Now the story progresses quickly. By the third paragraph, it is off and running. So are we and so is Alice, like literally. She's off after the white rabbit. She follows it down the rabbit hole. Pretty quickly, we see how weird the story is going to get because there's all these weird things down the rabbit hole. She goes down the rabbit hole all the way to this little hallway and she sees a bunch of doors off of it. There's one that opens into a beautiful garden, but it's such a small door she can't get to it. And the rabbit, meanwhile, has disappeared. That's the entire first chapter. Now, while she's going down the rabbit hole and through the hallway, she keeps talking to herself. She keeps asking herself questions. So in this way, Alice is a stand-in for the audience because we're asking questions too, but also it shows her to be that sort of inquisitive child. And when she gets in the hallway, things get odder because she drinks out of the little bottle, which makes her shrink, and then she eats the little cake, which makes her grow. This has the virtue of demonstrating how peculiar things are going to get in this story. There's also a little table with a key on it, which she only notices once she shrinks. That would get her through the door she wants to get through. Uh, then once she eats, the little cake, it makes her grow so tall she forgets about the key and just kind of has a meltdown and cries a lot at how big she's gotten. Okay, so chapter two. She has grown so much that she's just kind of, what do I do? Meltdown time, she cries a lot. The rabbit hurries by and in the process it drops its fan and gloves. Alice picks them up kind of absentmindedly and starts fanning herself. Pretty soon she realizes the fanning motion has caused her to shrink back down. However, she hasn't gotten the key and she can't get it now. Plus, she's cried so much she's created a pool of tears which she falls into. There are many other small animals that also have fallen into the pool of tears and are swimming for their life, including a mouse with which she strikes up a conversation. Now, at the beginning of chapter three, all the animals find a bank of land and gather upon it. They're all soaking wet. The mouse offers to tell a long, dry, story and proceeds to. Part of its story is actually 
The uh, reading aloud that the sister does in the um, popular Disney version of Alice. Edwin and Morcar, the earls of Mercia and Northumbria, declared for him, and even Stig and that part. However, the story does nothing to actually dry them off, so the dodo suggests a caucus race. All this is in the book is all of them running for a half an hour until they dry off. Then the mouse offers to tell them another long tale, and it's very cutely done in the book. I'll show you here. Look at this. Isn't this great? It's the literal tale. This is how Alice is picturing it. However, the mouse keeps getting interrupted, gets ticked, and never does finish its story. Part of the interrupting is done by Alice, who can't stop talking about her cat. This spooks the other animals, and they suddenly find excuses for other things they forgot to do, and run off and leave her, and Alice is very sad to be alone. So at the beginning of the next chapter, Alice is alone. The rabbit comes by again. Alice is its same size by this point. It mistakes her for its housemaid and sends her to its house to get something. Well, Alice runs along willingly, finds the house, goes in. When she's there, she sees another little bottle, drinks out of it. This makes her grow again, and she fills the whole house. The rabbit comes back, is not too happy to find its house filled by whatever the heck is going on here. It enlists the help of some of the other animals to try and clear the house out. They try plenty of th different things, including throwing pebbles at the window. The pebbles hit the ground, they turn into little cakes. Alice sees this, gets an idea, grabs a cake, eats it, and shrinks back down and escapes the house. Then she goes on through the woods. She encounters a puppy, which is interesting because the puppy is about the only animal in this place that does not seem to have the power of speech or human-like brain. So she would love to play with the puppy, but unfortunately she's too small and it would probably eat her. So that wouldn't go too well. So then she continues on her way until she comes upon the caterpillar on the mushroom. The caterpillar is singularly unhelpful, other than advising her to eat different sides of the mushroom to adjust her height. It doesn't give any detail about this. So she picks one side and another, and then goes on her way, nibbles at one, shoots up crazy high, bumps into the pigeon's nest. We all remember that pigeon, serpent! I love that pigeon. So then she tries the other piece, shrinks back down, and nibbles a little bit from one to the other until she gets to about what she feels is the right height. She comes upon a house that is approximately four feet high, so she shrinks back down to nine inches so that she has the potential of entering the house. In chapter six, the first thing she notices is two servants uh, discussing something in front of the house. The one servant is the footman of the house. The other servant has come from the queen with an invitation for the duchess to play croquet with the queen. Alice enters the house, finds the duchess uh, with a baby and a cook who is seasoning soup, I believe, uh, some type of food with way too much pepper that makes everybody sneeze. The Cheshire cat is also in this house. That's the first time Alice sees him. She leaves the house, goes on her way. She sees the cat again sitting in the tree. They have a long conversation. The cat directs her to either the Mad Hatter or the March Hare. So Alice then continues. She finds the March Hare house. The major difference, other than a lot more conversation, is the Dormouse, which is very sleepy but does wake up enough to contribute to the conversation rather significantly. On leaving, Alice comes upon a tree which has a door in it. She goes through the door and finds herself in the same hallway that she was in earlier. However, she is now the right size to get the key off the table. She grabs the key, goes through the little door once she shrunk back down, and finds herself in the garden that she had seen before, which proves to be the Queen's Garden. Chapter 8, we have a brief encounter with the gardeners who are painting the roses the appropriate color. Then along comes the king, queen, their entire entourage. It's the king, the queen, the knave of hearts, otherwise known as the jack and the deck. Then there are the soldiers and ten royal children. So they begin a weird little game of croquet. Alice makes conversation with first the rabbit, then the Cheshire cat. The queen finds fault with everyone, off with their heads, etc. Uh, lastly, she finds fault with the Cheshire cat and wants to sentence it, but it is just a cat and it belongs to someone. Alice informs her it belongs to the Duchess. The Duchess was already there having accepted her invitation, but has already been sentenced to death and is in prison. 
So they call for the Duchess to come. By the time the Duchess gets there, the cat has completely disappeared, so the royals say, eh, and resume their game of croquet. In the beginning of the ninth chapter, the Duchess kind of leads Alice off to the side, and they have a little discussion, in which the Duchess proves to have a moral for everything, a, a completely unrelated moral, which reminds me of Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> from my youth of the 80s. It just He-Man and She-Ra, they always had these seemingly unrelated morals to everything. We sure did have a difficult time today liberating the villagers from Hordak. If only those villagers had remembered to brush their teeth, it might not have been so difficult. Brush your teeth, boys and girls. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's a car somewhere that's going yeah, it's kind of catchy. I'm kind of getting down. These these are the chances you take filming outside. I'm gonna resume, and if it keeps going, it'll be good background music, right? Sure. It's related, I'm sure. So, the queen finally finds them having wandered off, and she is not happy. She orders the duchess to either, either her head's gonna be gone or she's gonna be gone. The duchess takes the hint and scampers. However, the queen is super impatient and winds up ordering pretty much everyone to their deaths, save the royals and Alice. So at that point, the game really can't continue. The queen decides to bring Alice to meet the mock turtle so it can tell her its history. Chapter 10, the mock turtle recites its history, uh, helped by its friend, the griffin. All three of them attempt recitations, none of which go right. And as the Mock Turtle is finishing up its history, word comes that a trial is beginning. So the Griffin takes Alice and they run off to find out what's going on. In the 11th chapter, this trial proves to be not for Alice as in the movie we all know and love. It is for the Knave of Hearts. In regards to the poem, the Queen of Hearts, she made some tarts on a summer's day. The Knave of Hearts, he stole those tarts and took them clean away. There's more to it, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Ooh, the cicadas are going now. Oh boy, this is so exciting. I don't know what's gonna happen filming outside. So anyway, witnesses are called in the trial, the Mad Hatter and the Duchess's cook. Neither of them know anything about what's going on, so are incredibly unhelpful. While this is happening, Alice and the audience feels herself growing again, just of her own accord. Then she's called up as the last witness. In the 12th chapter, Alice can't be any more of a help as a witness because she doesn't know what's going on either. She gives responses that are those of the March Hare in the film. What do you know about this business? The king said to Alice. Nothing, said Alice. Nothing whatever, persisted the king. Nothing whatever, said Alice. That's very important, the king said, turning to the jury. Then they invoke Rule 42. It doesn't do very much because, again, distractions occur. Eventually, Alice gets so big that she really doesn't... She has had enough of all this nonsense and how the trial is not going as it should, so she has no compunction with it, whatever about speaking up and protesting about it. She calls them all nothing but a pack of cards. The cards rise up in the air and fall upon her. And this is where she wakes up, her head in her sister's lap, and her sister is brushing away the dead leaves that have fallen from the tree onto Alice's face. Alice tells her sister all about her dream, and then goes in for tea. Now, the end of chapter 12 is not Alice, it is her sister. It's kind of an epilogue, if you will. Her sister stays by the pond a few more moments, mulling over what her sister has told her, and she has a daydream of her own about Wonderland and its real-life counterparts. And she reflects that, as her sister and the rest of us, even though they may grow older, this is the sort of thing that she will look back on and remember, this dream that she had. It will keep her imagination alive and help her remember what it was to be a child. There are so many great lines in this book, and I'm not going to cover them because we know most of them. Just this last part struck me where her sister is mulling over Alice's dream. Lastly, she pictured to herself how the same little sister of hers would, in the aftertime, be herself a grown woman, and how she would keep through all her riper years the simple and loving heart of her childhood, and how she would gather about her other little children, and make their eyes bright and eager with many a strange tale, perhaps even with the dream of Wonderland of long ago, 
and how she would feel with all their simple sorrows, and find a pleasure in all their simple joys, remembering her own child life and the happy summer days. Okay, so that is the entire book. Uh, if you're familiar with the film that most of us know and love, you know, um, you will notice some different things, particularly the absence of Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They did not come about until the second book through the Looking Glass, which frankly I like that one a little better. I always thought it was so cool to go through the mirror. Now I want to briefly touch on the whole... <clears throat> there was the friendship, right, between Charles Lutwidge Dodgson, aka Lewis Carroll, and Alice Liddell. These are the stories that he told her that led to the whole publication. Now, that seems a little weird, right? An older man befriending a young girl, and there is some question as to what was the level of appropriateness of their relationship. Um, however, so far after the fact, one can't be sure. Alice herself never spoke up about anything. I doubt she would have, given the time. Um, but these things can also, they can also be innocent, and one hopes that's what it was. Um, so I will go no further on that topic because there's simply no way of knowing. Oh, we got us another song. Okay, I'm going to keep talking and hope that that doesn't mess things up for, you know, copyright or whatever. My goodness. Okay, point number two, and this is just something that irritates me, is when grown-ups tend to assign meanings to things in kids' books that aren't necessarily there. These books are meant for kids. They're not meant for grown-ups. There is not necessarily a double meaning, by which I am referring to possible drug references. There was a whole drug culture in the 60s that grew up um, with this book as, you know, the whole meaning behind it or whatever. And that's fine. You, you take from it what you take from it and, you know, it was an interesting culture and, you know, the whole Jefferson Airplane White Rabbit and, and all that. But the book itself, the story is for kids. It's, I'm sorry, it's nothing to do with drugs. Even if there is a mushroom in it, and even then people knew that some mushrooms had hallucinogenic properties, and that may have given rise to it. However, she's also walking through a forest, and in forested areas there are going to be mushrooms, and that seems a logical place for a character to hang out on top of it, and her to come up to it when she's that height, and etc. If anything, I would say that it's more a cautionary tale against just eating or drinking whatever you happen to come across because you never know what is going to happen to you if you do that. But also, it just seems to be a, a simple way of answering the fun idea when you're a kid of what, what would it be like to be this big or this little? And I don't think there's anything more to it than that. Okay, last point real quick. There have been many adaptions of Alice over the years. I have alluded to this before and none of them really seem to work. And I think that's because they want to make a typical Western story out of it and send Alice on the hero's journey and, you know, have her, like, not literally, but uh, growing as a person, having learned lessons by the end of it. And it's simply not that sort of story. There's really no particular lesson here. It's a child's story. It's imagination for imagination's sake. It's play. It's fun. It's an homage to childhood, and that's okay. And this, interesting, I, I thought of this while I was making notes for this video. I think that's a lot of it. It's what gives the story staying power. It's why it endures. It is an homage to childhood. It is a return to childhood. Every time you read it, it is a return to a place where nothing makes sense. And Alice continually asks herself questions and tries to make sense of the world around her. And that's childhood. That's childhood in a nutshell. That's growing to adulthood. That is adulthood. That's life. And we return to the story every so often to say, see, life is random and confusing. And sometimes you just don't understand what's going on and you have to muddle through as best you can. This guy gets it. So. That is my take on Alice in Wonderland. What are your thoughts? I want to know. I want to know so much. Let's discuss this book because I, I still love this book.
When was the last time you read it? How many times have you read it? Are you keeping score? Because who knows I'm not. Oh my gosh, I've read it countless times, I'm sure. And what are your thoughts on the story? Why do you, why do you think it ends yours? So other than that, that is all I got. Um, leave your thoughts below, and I'll see you next week. Bye.